Welcome to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin. I'm here with author Nathaniel Philbrick. He has penned several bestsellers, including In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex, which won the National Book Award and which is being adapted into a film directed by Ron Howard, uh, Mayflower, A Story of Courage, Community, and War, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and The Last Stand, Custer, Sitting Bull, and the Battle of Lig Little Bighorn. His most recent book is Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution, getting great reviews and has also been optioned by actor and director Ben Affleck as a potential film. I wanted to spend this uh, web extra talking a little bit about your writing style and methods which I found very interesting and eerily similar to some of the ways that I research my, my programs. First though, um, I think it's kind of fun, your name, Nathaniel yes. Philbrick. First of all, it sounds very historical, but Nathaniel has some resonance as well, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, my father's an English professor, and uh, and so I was named for Nathaniel Hawthorne. So uh, you got it right, go. Ben. Yes, exactly. You got it right, and you got to yeah. be interested in the water because Hawthorne was yeah, Melville's it, muse, huh? Melville's muse. Uh, he fa in fact, he dedicated Moby Dick to him. So yeah, it's all See, it's you know, all in there. It's just, yeah, you know, connected. It was in, yeah. in the womb. You, 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 <laughs> yeah, you, apparently you were bound to come out. Even though I did writing. grow up in the maritime center of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so. Well, you know, it's there and. Um, it's great the way you get water into all your all your books anyway. Um, you don't have a PhD though. Right. So help me here, are you still a historian? Well, David McCullough didn't have a PhD either. He nope. went to the same elementary school you did in Pittsburgh. Again, something in the water. Um, and he was called a historian. So do you consider yourself a historian or a writer? Uh, you know, a I, journalist? I, I consider myself a writer who who writes about history. Writes about history. Uh, you know, I am obviously not an academic historian. I have nothing but huge respect for academic historians whose work is absolutely essential to everything I do. But, uh, you know, I am a storyteller and, uh, and uh, who tries to do due diligence uh, historically. And for me, from the very beginning, since I, I am not uh, trained in the academy, my uh, introduction to writing about history was kind of on the ground. I, I went to the archives uh, in in Nantucket when I was writing the books the that were... actual archives, you touched them, you didn't go on the internet. Exactly. That's this the was way back in the day. This was in the 80s and 90s when uh, people actually touched <laughs> documents. But uh, for me, it was absolutely essential because uh, mm -hmm. once I got into the archives, I would discover documents I didn't sure. know were there. And now it's amazing what you can do on the internet, but you're searching. You're looking for things you're already That's looking right. for. For me, the best stuff was stuff I stumbled on. Uh, well, it's like going to the library. Yeah, in the stacks. And the stacks, open stacks. Yeah. I, I don't like closed stacks because open stacks, you see the book that's right next to the one that you went looking for, and, and that that's, one, that's, and that's the where key. it all happens. And so for me, I'm always kind of trying to recreate those kinds of circumstances. And so I, I still, even though uh, I could basically do a lot of it on my computer, I go to the archives, um, go to the places, because I'm always finding yeah. things and, and detail. You know, you never quite know what goes in, works its way into the book, but for me it's just absolutely essential to go to the places, go to the archives, talk with archivists who know their collections, and inevitably come up with something that I wouldn't have known otherwise. Well, and maps, I think you pinned up a lot of maps when you were writing Bunker Hill to yes. take a look at what yeah. Boston... My, my, I have a, a one-room office that's crammed with books, but also has maps all around it. And I, I took these historic maps of Boston, blew them up to poster size, put them on poster board, and put them around and scribbled on them. And for me, it was, you know, kind of the immersive... Uh, thing where I could really begin to try to figure out what it was like as a community. Where did people live? You know, what streets did they use? Sure. Those kinds of things. And once again, you never know how much of it actually gets into the book, but it was an important to the process. Yeah, you just have to immerse yourself, as you said. And um, each book, as you mentioned in the main program, um, starts with a question you have. I mean, you don't really know what you're getting into, right? No. And if you did, it probably wouldn't have as much resonance because you're. You, like going down those alleyways and crooked streets, you're figuring it out as you go along. Right. I mean, I for me, it's almost kind of a kinetic process of discovery, and um, I think that's where the juice comes from. It's going, whoa, I didn't know that, and, the, and what about this character? And um, and so I, I find myself, particularly, it's a, each book's about three years, and the first year is trying to 
learn about the topic as best I can, creating a bibliography. And it's then where I'm going, wow, I didn't know that. And I'm scribbling it all down in a notebook. And uh, I then go back when it comes about a year later to beginning the writing process. I go back to that notebook and type those all out. And it's amazing. I, I often have completely forgotten those epiphanies, but there they are. And it's those epiphanies that inevitably are, uh, have contained the details that are, the, I think, the most uh, interesting to the reader. Because it's when you don't know about a topic that you figure out what's interesting to people. I think you can know too much and you're not, you know, oh yeah, I knew that. But you sort of miss the fact that it's really kind of interesting yes. that, you know, to someone who doesn't know a lot about it, that's, that's the detail that matters. So you're essentially keeping a running journal of yes. your thoughts as you come across these things, uh, little well, exclamation I, points. And I spent all yesterday in planes coming to Boise, and um, and I was reading, you know, a biography of Washington with my notebook, scribbling it down, and I get really into it. I mean, I, and I'm, you know, I'm doing stars and and coming up with concepts, and how about this as an angle to come in, that kind of thing, and and I just do it for a year, and then type all that up. And, and it's now, that once again, a part of my consciousness in slightly more organized fashion. Well, that's that note-taking, and that's where I say that that's my process, too, is for some reason I have to still, and I have to have the printed, the paper, you know, yes. take notes, then notes on notes. Scribbling then, is very important. Yeah, yes. and, then, and then print it out, and more notes on notes, until you just have it in your head, so you can have a conversation about it. Um, yeah, it's but a, it's that it's, note taking that's yeah, so absolutely. important. For me, uh, it's seventy five percent of my time is the reading, the note taking, the note taking on the notes to to organize right. it. Each chapter uh, begins with a bunch of notes. Then I take notes on the stuff that I'm reading specifically for it, and then and, and I have potentially a hundred pages and. And what I'm trying pages for each chapter. Each chapter, and right. so what I'm trying to do, and, and you hit upon it earlier, is try to get it in my head. No one can contain an entire book in their head. Maybe there, I'm sure there are people a lot brighter than me that can, but I can't. I have to work chapter by chapter, and so what I am doing over the process of about a month is trying to get to the point where I've got as as much of that information in a sort of organized mm -hmm. outline in my head that when I start writing. It, it starts it just going. Flows. Yeah, it and because. Uh, but you have to have an entry. Do you have to have an entry point and an exit point? Like with Bunker Hill, as I mentioned in the main program, it's so well done with starting with John Quincy Adams as a boy and ending with him as an older man. I didn't know I was going to end it know, that way. But okay. So I you mean, didn't, you didn't have I your, mean, the your, best stuff. That aha moment would, must have been great, though. Oh, gosh. It was like uh, <laughs> when I go, oh, my God, this is it. I mean, you know, for me it was, and um, and once again, often those are the best things that come relatively late and come with revision, because uh, the revision process so important, is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and and that's, for example, with Mayflower, I was trying to write the chapter about the first Thanksgiving, and um, and it was okay, but I, you know, I just there needed something more, and and it, I was almost done with the book, and uh, uh, I was driving from uh, Cape Cod to Boston in late October and the th leaves are changing and I go re I realize well this was a, the time of year when the actual Thanksgiving happened this would have been the first time the pilgrims saw leaves changing in a New I England remember that autumn. sentence in that book and I gotta research how that works and anyways it became the paragraph that I think made that chapter and it was probably the last thing I wrote in the book and so that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm trying to, to find those details that provide a interesting perspective and you work in speaking of bunker hill you work in a in a base in a, in bunker, a bunker in a, in a bunker, bunker basically yes. right no i have windows. a view i have i yes i have a view i have a window that has a view of a of a cinder block wall <laughs> and um yeah everybody thinks i live on nantucket and stare out dreamily at the waves <laughs> and i'm inspired by the cosmic nature around me and no i i, I go into a, a bunker and um uh, try to you know, I even, if st too much is going on outside, yeah. I put on the headphones, the sound. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm just trying to focus. And, um, and, but f that said, it's very important for me to have breaks in the day. Usually emerge. Emerge and see people. Yeah. And so I'm lucky I live near downtown Nantucket. Wow. And even in February, I can walk down to Main Street and see people <laughs> and, and then r plunge back in. And uh, so I, you know, the community is very important for me, but it's not the cosmic nature stuff. And you read, you have your wife, um, 
read it out loud? Or oh, you read I read it, it, out, read loud. it out loud to your wife. Yes, every chapter, I, um, uh, she comes home from work and sort of groans when she realizes there's a, a stapled <laughs> 25 pages. You're waiting like yeah, right. And so we eat dinner and you know she you know and then as she's doing the dishes I read it to her and she has a little notepad beside her where she scribbles down uh, stuff and inevitably I say what was wrong with that? She's just keep reading, keep reading it. So but for me it's as much her input is very important but it's also the act of reading. It's um, something that looks fine on the computer screen when I'm actually reading it sounds all wrong. Well, and, and you have to do that with television scripts as well. Yes. You, go, you have to read them out loud over and over and over Right, again. and the spoken word is really what we're trying to uh, create, and, and so it's, um, so for me that's important, so then I redo it and then send a <laughs> copy to uh, my, my parents, uh, who, uh, my, and my father is the retired English professor, and um, they provide uh, input, and then once I've integrated that, I move on. What about scholars? Do you send them to... Once I'm done with a book, and my editor, Wendy Wolf at Viking, I've been with Wendy for four, 15 years That's now. That's critical, isn't and, it? And yeah. she's old school, tough, and um, really good. And once we've gotten it to a point where it's close, I then send it to as many as a dozen right. Peop, uh, experts in the field, and and that's a whole different kind of input. Uh, although some of them are very free in their editorial <laughs> comments, but a lot of it's geared towards factual things. Well, one thing you don't do is try and reconstruct dialogue. You know, there's some people no. who do historical fiction no, I, or, yeah. or whatever, and it, it's almost impossible. I would think. No, to do I, that. I and I think it's kind of corny sometimes, actually. Yeah, and I, I think it sort of. Um, contaminates it in a way. I mean, if I have dialogue in my book, it's from from a diary, from or something. a diary, from someone's account. And um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm. Uh, you know, people will often say, "Well, why don't you write a historical novel?" And I just don't have yeah. that kind of imagination. I can't create a fictive world. I'm just trying to take, try to create as best I can what actually happened. Although you might write a memoir, as I understand it, right? Or yes, yeah. I'm. I, I've got. Um, you know, I, I I wrote a really little book called Why Read Moby Dick, yeah, uh, it's which a is good book. and um, was for me a lot of fun, and it's a lot, very personal book. And there's actually some memoir type things I think we in have there. A, can we put up a shot of that? Yeah, Why yeah. Read Moby Dick. And um, and and it got me to thinking that there's a lot of things in my past and and um, that I uh, in my childhood that I'd I'd like to explore at some point. Yeah, and, you know, we'll see. Cool. Um, now, all of that note taking and everything you're able to condense down to a proposal, right? Which is essentially like the preface to your, to your book. I, I really enjoy the prefaces and conclusions to your book. Yeah, uh, well. And that's important for you as well, right? To be able to do that, to make a synopsis and tell people why you're writing this. Yeah, with each book, you know, um, there's I think a tendency to get kind of complacent. Okay, yeah, now my next book will be about this. And, um, and that, and that begins with that, but you don't really know what you're talking about when you say that. So for me, I always do a fairly detailed proposal of 20 or plus pages for my editor. And it's really as much for me as it is for her because it requires me to do some preliminary research, really figure it out, and explain it. You know, th writing is thinking. And unless you do the, unless, at least I do that process, I really don't know what I'm getting myself into. So it's for my benefit as much as anything. And then when it comes to the actual writing the books, as you mentioned, the preface for me is where I, I will write 30, 40, 50 drafts of it, experiment with different scenes uh, as I struggle to get a, a handle on what it is exactly I want to say. Is it anxiety provoking? Oh, absolutely. The whole process is anxiety <laughs> provoking. And as my wife can tell you, and, uh, uh, but I love it. And it's, it's kind of, I mean, there's, it's what's nice is a three year arc and there are different phases and, and some are more anxiety provoking than others. <laughs> and, um, uh, but um, it, is, it is what I enjoy doing. Well, one of the things that I think uh, is, resonates with me about your books is you're, you include the darker sides of history as well. Yeah. And that's important to you, I assume, as well, to not, th these layers and, you know, for instance, in Bunker Hill, you have scenes where um, people in Boston are tarring and feathering yeah. a loyalist and, or a Brit. Yeah. And, and it's horrifying. Yeah. I, and the horror has been kind of a preoccupation of mine from the beginning, um, <laughs> as my wife can probably tell you, too. I mean, no, but I, I'm, 
I, I just, I have always had a hard time with sort of standard na uh, notions of heroes uh, because we're all flawed individuals and there is a darkness underlying uh, life and, and yet there is so much good. And so what I'm trying to do in my books is to pr not show the sunny ennobling side. That's so easy. Um, and you're just cherry picking the good stuff. The fact is, even the most noble people have you know, uh, have traits that they're not proud of. We're all people, and uh, it's always been this way. In the past, they were not better than us; they were just like us under different circumstances. And so I'm I'm trying to um, wrestle with that sort of the both sides of it, and um, and because it, it's for me, it only seems like the true side. And and to like do Melville, other. huh? Yeah, I mean Melville <laughs> is my man. I mean I, he's. He's, he's always been um, the one that, you know, he saw the darkness, um, uh, but he also saw the great potential. And, uh, and, I, and I hopefully that's kind of where I'm, I am. Great. Well, thanks for taking the time to... Oh, it's to been a pleasure. Thank you. Tell us more about how you write your books, which I always find so interesting. Thank you very much. You've been listening to author Nathaniel Filbert. On this Dialogue Web Extra, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in.